The scripture says, study to show thyself approved. Study. The Bible said, much study is a weariness of the flesh. Father, I pray now, Lord, for the gift of teaching. And I pray you'd open the hearts of the people to receive your word. I pray it in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. We've been talking about parables. Now we're going to talk about parables and mysteries. Look at Mark chapter number 4 and verse number 11. And I'll show you the connection between the two. Parable and a mystery. Matthew chapter, Mark chapter number 4 and verse number 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Did you notice that? Now the Greek word parabole means to go alongside of. And uh, a parable is something that is given for the sole purpose of allowing some to see and understand and others not. In other words, it is a, it is, it's a dividing line. It sets one group on one side and another group on the other side. That's the purpose of the parable. And uh, you'll remember, if you'll go over here to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter number 12, Matthew 12, when we were in this before, and it's good to, uh, it's good to refresh yourself, Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 14 Matthew 12, 14, the Bible said, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. They had officially now declared that he was to be destroyed. They had already said that what he did, he did by the power of the devil. They had already said he was demon-possessed. They had already said that he was of illegitimate birth. They had been demonizing him in every way possible. And now they have officially... Uh, officially agreed to destroy him. Now look at chapter number 13 of Matthew and verse number 3. Right after they did this, Matthew 13, 3. Matthew 13, 3. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Now what's going on here? Well, when they had officially rejected him, and, and, and decided to destroy him, then the first thing to show up after that is a parable. Isn't that remarkable? Say coincidental, preacher. There's no coincidence in the Bible. The parable shows up once they had officially declared uh, for, for him to be non gratis, to do away with him. He's finished. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do away with him. Then the parables show up. And the parables, of course, have a reason. Uh, and you'll notice that I told you before how that, ma that, uh, that uh, Isaiah chapter number 6 is quoted seven times in the New Testament. And three times uh, a direct application is made to the blinding of Israel. So they are blinded now to the word of God. They're blinded to the identity of Christ. There's two types of blinding in the New Testament. One is the judicial blinding that comes because of sin. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Then there is this judicial blinding that has to do with Israel as a corporate body, as a collective group of people. God has blinded Israel. And of course, by doing that, he identifies them, sets them apart. That means that there will be some group recognized as Israel in the end times. Of course, we know who they are, but the point is that he's blinded them. Therefore, we have mysteries and we have parables. The mystery is the state of, of revealed truth and knowledge, but it can only be understood by a revelation from God. Only by a revelation from God. Now, who was Moses to Israel? What was he? The greatest, the greatest identity of Moses to Israel. He's the lawgiver. Moses is the lawgiver. Well, the, there is a New Testament counterpart to Moses, and this is the man as he relates to the church of God. And who is that? That's Paul. That's Saul of Tarsus. A.T. Robertson wrote a book, said, and the title of his book was, Paul, 
the interpreter of Christ. And that's very good because the Apostle Paul is the one who interprets the body of Christ, the cross, and the meaning of the cross, the blood covenant. For he, if Paul wrote Hebrews, and I'm inclined to believe he did, it is the Apostle Paul who laid all these things down and interpreted Christ. Therefore, it is Paul who becomes the Moses to the church of God. You see what I mean? The analogy, the comparison between the two. So the mystery, the mysteries are revealed according to conditional things that happen to the children of Israel. And I'm going to show you that conditional thing right now because this conditional thing is the basis for understanding what develops from it. You remember I told you that the key to understanding the New Testament is the Jew. If you don't get the Jew in his correct place, you will forever be in a turmoil to try to put the New Testament together. Amen. Look at Luke chapter number 16 and verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. There is a clear line of separation. See that? The law and the prophets were until John, but since that time the kingdom of God is preached every man presseth into it. Now look at Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. And verse number... 11, verily, verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now look at this. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Now watch verse 14. This is the key. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. John the Baptist could have fulfilled the qualifications of Elijah the prophet that's prophesied in the book of Malachi. John could have fulfilled that. But now what are we talking about? Go back to the book of Malachi. Malachi, verse number 5, chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet. Now, Elijah, Old Testament, Eliyah. Jehovah is Elohim, or Jehovah is God. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Christ. See how quick you caught that? You notice how that these new Bibles and the new theology is that there's no difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. They're interchangeable. They are not interchangeable. There's a big difference between the two. And when you get to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, it's changed from day of Christ to day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an Old Testament prophecy of a period of time that stretches for a thousand and seven years. That's the day of the Lord. Prophesied over and over and over and over and over and over again. Constantly. The day of the Lord on one hand is a time of rejoicing, the millennium. The, the time of the, of the Messiah. The day of the Lord on the other hand is a time of weeping and wailing and judgment to come upon the people. So the day of the Lord over and over again is a prophecy. What did he tell them? He said in Matthew chapter number 11, if you will accept John the Baptist, he will fulfill the prophecy of Elias, which was for to come. But what is Elias coming for? What's the context of, 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 uh, of, uh, of Malachi chapter 4? I know, but what context? What's the, what's the context? Day of the Lord, right? The day of the Lord, you see? The day of the Lord. Well, then, preacher, how does that work out? Well, let me say something, and I want you to think about what I'm, what I'm saying. There is not one verse of Scripture, not one word in that whole, whole, all of that Old Testament that said there had to be anything like a church age that lasted for 2,000 years. Amen. Not one time. But we know it has lasted for 2,000 years. But that's easy because we have hindsight 
And in retrospection, we can look back and say, well, my goodness, the church age has been here for 2,000 years. Yes, it has. But there's not one word in that Old Testament that said there had to be a church age that lasted for 2,000 years. As a matter of fact, there's nothing in there that talks about a church age, period. It talks about a millennium. It talks about a reign of peace by the Messiah on this earth through Israel. It talks about all this. And when the Lord Jesus came into this world and was taken as a baby, Simeon lifted him up and said, Behold, a light to lighten the Gentiles. So there's no question that the Lord Jesus was going to be a Gentile Savior along with a Jewish Savior, the Savior of the whole world. But there's nothing in there about a church age lasting 2,000 years. We take for granted a lot of things that we better look at carefully. In plain words, what you're saying then is, preacher, that the day of the Lord could have come. Absolutely. That's what he just said. He said the day of the Lord could come because Elias would be the prophet to bring in the day of the Lord. Well, would the Gentiles be saved? Certainly they'd be saved. Are Gentiles going to be saved in the millennium? Will they be saved from through what, what group of people? Israel, the Jews. Absolutely. Seven men take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, we've heard the Lord's with you. Absolutely, the Jew will be elevated to the head of all the nations again. The light of the, world, of the world will be shining forth from Jerusalem. And the Gentile nations will have to come and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't come and keep the Feast of Tabernacles, God will send a plague down upon them. And their skin will melt away on their face. Say, so where's that at? That's in Zechariah. <laughs> That's the Old Testament. So this 2,000 years that we have enjoyed here as the day, as the day of Christ or, the church, or the, the church of God, this 2,000, not the day of Christ, the day of Christ is seven years in the tribulation, but have enjoyed as the, as the church age, the day of grace, there's nowhere in that Old Testament that said we had to have a 2,000 year period of time like that. Now, just kind of nail that down somewhere and, and, and fix that because that's a, that's a good reference point and starting point to understand what's going on in the New Testament. It's awful easy to look back at it and see how things fall in place. But while this was happening, it wasn't all that easy to see how things were falling into place. For example, God took Moses to the top of Sinai and he gave him the law. He gave him the law. He took him to the top of Sinai. The first time Moses went up there, Moses carried some, uh, Moses, uh, Moses went up there, God took, God produced the stones and wrote in them with the finger of God. Next time Moses went up there, Moses carried his own stones with him. That's quite remarkable. He carried his own stones. There was a difference between the first pair and the second pair. When, Mo, when, 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 when the apostle, when the, when the gospel was preached and the twelve were scattered and the Lord sent them out to the ends of the earth, he told them to go not in the way of the Gentiles, go unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So they went out and they preached. They preached. But when God called Saul of Tarsus, he more than likely, I can't prove this, but he more than likely took him to the same spot that he took Moses in Arabia. Because the Bible says that I went into Arabia, Galatians chapter number 1. Amen. Well, Sinai is not in Arabia. Oh, yes, it is. Amen. According to the scripture, Sinai is in Arabia. Well, it's kind of, you know, romantic idea that Moses, was st Moses stood on one spot and got the law, and then here comes the apostle Paul standing on the same spot. <laughs> and he gets the New Testament, half of it, Right? He wrote half of it. He, he, was the, he was the made without question. If you've ever read the New Testament, there's no question. The Apostle Paul wrote the vast majority of what we read and hold dear is the Scripture. So Revelation, Revelation coming from God comes to Sinai. And there it is given to Moses, and there it was more than likely given to the Apostle Paul. Now don't hold me to it. I can't prove that he was at Sinai, but I'd, I'd like to believe that that's where he was, and, uh, when, he was uh, when he received the law. It's just like the Mount of Transfiguration. Don't let anybody browbeat you into telling you they know which mountain he went to. We don't know. I, I did go up to the top of the mountain uh, over there. It's a, uh, not Herman. It's uh, what is it? Oh, I forget. You'll never forget the ride if you ever go to it. I'll tell you that right now. They've got a church on top of it. It's uh, well, I swear I can't remember. 
it's a, it's, a, it's, 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 histor it's traditionally, it is the Mount of Transfiguration. I'll think of it in a minute. And we went to the top of that mountain, and you go on a road that wraps around the outside of that mountain, and you can look down, and buddy, you better be ready to go, <laughs> because you're liable to be going down this way quicker than you're going up that way. <laughs> And the driver, it doesn't seem to bother him one bit. He's just flying away, man. <laughs> so apparently, he, <laughs> apparently he's got everything right with God and he didn't worry about the crowd behind him. <laughs> Up you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's quite a trip. So there are things in the Bible that you can't be certain of, and you can't be certain where the apostle Paul went to Sinai. But anyway, he received a revelation from God. Now, this revelation from God is a big deal. Because a revelation from God is like holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, right? No prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. Prophecy of the scripture came not from the will of men, but it came from God. God spoke through them. The Greek word for that is theos noustos. Noustos is from pneuma, which means to breathe. Theos is from theos, which is God. So it literally means God breathed. So the scripture is breathed from God. God breathed. How? Through the Holy Ghost. Amen. He breathed into these men and they wrote the Bible. Amen. And now you say, well, a man wrote the Bible. He sure did. But God's the author of it. And that man was incapable of error while he was writing it. Amen. Yes, sir. Incapable of error. That's what we mean when we say inspiration. When we say the Bible is inspired, we say the Bible did not originate with men. It came from God. And it was written down, and when it was written, it was written in, uh, in, in perfect accuracy, without error. So revelation is given in the New Testament on a conditional basis. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.16, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. All right? Uh, and uh, about the third phrase there, let me find it for you. 1 Timothy 3.16. If you'd like to turn there with me. 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, grace and mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh, number one, justified in the spirit, number two, but look at the third one, seen of angels. All right. Now hold your, hold your place there and go to Hebrews 1. When he bringeth the first begotten into the world, verse 6, Hebrews 1, 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Here we've got a baby. The angels only know so much. The Bible said, seen of angels, 1 Timothy 3. When they see him, the command comes from above, worship him. The angel must make a choice now. Are you going to worship this baby or will you reject him? In other words, this baby, dear angel, is God Almighty. <laughs> That's right. Nothing less. This is God. Will you worship him or not? And some did and some probably chose not to. So how would they know not to? Or why would they refuse? Because there is in that eternal, perfect, absolute being an essence that only the Son has ever seen. And that's what Hebrews 1 is talking about when it talks about Him being the brightness of His glory and express image of His person. That word person, person, person there is, uh, is so very important because that is the, uh, what's that word? That is the essence of God, the essence of God, and uh, uh, hypostasis, that's it, hypostasis. The Greek word is hypostasis, Hebrews chapter number one. The essence of God. Has anything ever seen the essence of God? The Bible says in the, in the Beatitudes, the pure in heart shall see God. It's not so much of God making himself known to you. It is you being prepared to see him. Amen. 
You must be brought from stage to stage until you come to that point to where you have passed and left behind you all that is of the flesh, all is of the earthly house of this tabernacle, all that is of corruption, and you're brought into the presence of pure glory and pure light, and then you see him as he is. I'm not saying right now that an angel has ever seen that because you've been made, you've been made in the image of God. Being made in the image of God, you have access to the Father that nothing else has. That image of God is denigrated from the pulpit today like there's no... Most of the time when you hear a preacher talking about the image of God, all the world they talk about is the attributes of God. Well, we've got love. We have compassion. This, that, this. That's nothing, man. I mean, that's all good, but that's got nothing to do with the image of God. The image of God has to do with what you are. Only a man can commune with God. Only a man is ever said in that Bible to pray. Only a man will be able to see that pure essence of that pure being. And one day, that will be the blessing that is yours to be brought in his presence. So all of that to say this. Let the angels of God worship him. Remember, when that law was given by Moses, the law was given by Moses, grace and truth by Jesus Christ, it mentions more than once in the New Testament that the angels had part in the giving of the law. They had part in it. By the, by the, the scripture says the law came by the ministration of angels. Amen. Think about that for a moment. The law given by ministration of angels. But when it came to the gospel of the grace of God and God manifest in the flesh, the angel had nothing to do with it. All he could do is announce the virgin birth and announce the coming of the king. But as far as having anything to do with the giving of that gospel of the grace of God, the manifestation of it, no angel. No angel. This is why he's separate and the angels of God should worship him. And here he is. This is why in Revelation chapter number 12, a third of the angels of heaven, a third of the stars of heaven are pulled down, deceived by the power of the wicked one. The tempter. That's what it says in Matthew chapter number four. The tempter came. That's quite a thing. The tempter. They're brought, they're, they're, they're deceived. Amen. And then the scripture says that they're reserved for the lowest hell to Tartarus. They've been deceived. The angels have. So be awful careful. The apostle warned them in Colossians 2. Be awful careful about your association with angels. And understand that a definition of an angel is a far, far, more complicated thing in the Bible than simply something flying around out here with wings guiding little children across the bridge. That's beautiful art. But there's a whole lot more involved in an angel than that. A an angel in its basic meaning is a manifestation. It's an appearance. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was appearance of, of the Lord. And to be more technical, it's a Christophany. It's an appearance of Christ himself in the Old Testament. But the Bible talks about little children and their angel doth behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. When, Peter's, when Peter came to the door and Rhoda came to the door and they were praying for him, Rhoda came to the door and Peter was standing there. She went back and said, it's Peter, he's out here. You know, God's answered your prayer. And they said, no, it's his angel. Think about that. Think about that. Yeah, think about that. So these things that you get from the Bible, you've got to take hold of them and take what the Bible says about this. It's very important that these mysteries... This mystery, a revelation that can only come from God, how God has revealed to a man, the Bible said, things that angels desired to look into. Does it say that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It said God revealed to a man things that angels desired to look into. That makes it a Moses to me. <laughs> You better believe it. The Apostle Paul stood shoulder to shoulder in his importance and his relationship to the dissemination of the truth that Moses did. The angels desire to look into these things. So what does that mean, preacher? That means that I do not seek out angels for wisdom. And this is not to disparage holy angels or, or, or uh, Gabriel or Michael, but I do not seek them out 
For the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 1, Though I or an angel from heaven come preaching any other gospel, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. So who do you seek out? I take the word. I take the Bible. And I pray over it. And I believe it. And I read it. And I receive the word of God. That's why it's so important. These things are. An angel mess you up, folks. They can deceive you. Appear, they can appear as Christ himself. They sure can. They were so beautiful and such glory around them that the apostle John, one of the twelve, in awe struck, fell down before this angel and began to worship. And that angel, being a holy angel, said, get up. <laughs> Don't worship me. There's only one to worship. That's the holy one. So a mystery about the body of Christ, a mystery about the rapture of the church, a mystery about the coming of Christ, in other words, the, the end time, the, the apocalypse and all that, these mysteries begin to stack up in the New Testament. They begin to come one after another, after another, after another. And the mystery starts showing up when the parables have done what they're going to do because, you see, Christ preached the parables but when his ministry was over and he was gone, then what happens? Then you've got Paul preaching mysteries. See what I mean? See the progression? See how one followed the other. Christ preached the parable and then Paul preached the mysteries. Now, if you come along like some of the so-called founding fathers of our country and say that Paul was one of the worst corruptors of Christianity, which was a blasphemous statement, God help him, he'll have to stand and give an account to God for it. You come along and make, that, make a statement like that, folks, uh, you're in trouble because if you say that the Apostle Paul is a corrupter of Christianity, then what you've done is thrown out the biggest part of the New Testament. Why would you believe any of what? Why would you believe 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st, 2nd Thess Thess Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, even Hebrews? Why would you believe that if the Apostle is a corrupter of Christianity? You've gutted the New Testament. You've done what Marcion did back there, the heretic they called him. Just gut it. You do what Jehudi did in the Old Testament. Take a penknife and just cut out what you don't like. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there who say, well, I like most of the Bible, but I don't like this part, and I don't like that part, and I'll get that thing out of there. It's a pretty good book except for this. <laughs> There's a lot of people around like that. <laughs> hey, what's that, brother? That's what happens. That's the subtle part. <laughs> That's that, over 5,000 places, uh, just to name a few, where they have jerked out, cut out, cut out, and so forth. Of course, all that cutting was done the first and second century after Christ. When you get into all of this other garbage, and you'll notice, just to chase a little rabbit for real quickly, you'll notice that these new Bibles, where they gut the New Testament, you go back and check the references on it, and you'll find out that what they're doing is walking lockstep with Gnosticism in the first and second century after Christ. Birds of a feather flock together. Amen, folks. Amen. You'll find they're walking lockstep, lockstep with, uh, with Gnosticism. Of course, they gnash at the teeth when you say something like that, and they get angry over it, but check it out. Check it out. Check it out. And you'll be surprised at the uh, correlation between the two. So you've got a mystery. And the mystery is something that can only be understood and revealed by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Now the Greek word musterion, musterion, that's Greek. Latin, I think, is mus it's very similar. It's very close to it. It's, it's literally a transliteration. The, the Romans were good for that. Uh, it's mysterious or something like that. But it has to do with the mystery religions of 2,000 years ago. The mystery religions were a big deal, folks, big deal. What made them so big, one of the things, is that you had to be an initiate. You had to be trained. You had to be instructed. You had to be confirmed to become part of their group, of the organization. Why? Because in order to continue to disseminate the same thing from generation to generation, you had to make sure that what they knew was according to the book, whatever they taught. You see what I mean? If, you, if, you're going to, if you're going to be in Mithra, the Mithran religion, a hundred years from now, then you're going to have a guru that teaches you today, and you're going to be confirmed by him that what you know is correct, and then you're going to teach it on down the line. And that's what happens. And it happens over and over and over again. Now, here's what's happened in this country and around the world. Since the church has become apostate, 
and it's almost totally apostate now. Since the church has become apostate, has no power, it has no message. Anytime the church becomes ecumenical, anytime the church becomes all inclusive, that's a oh they love that word. That's a, oh that's a that's a sacrosanct in the political correct uh, dialogue. In other words, I include within my group everybody. We're so open-minded. We just accept everybody. We're all going to the same place. We're just going in different ways. Your religion of your culture, your religion of your culture, your religion of your time. Every religion has its truths. So why don't we just come together and just worship God in just one big happy family? That's ecumenicism. That's exactly what's going on in the churches today. That's what's happening. The church has lost its power. When it loses its... Sure they will. Religion's constantly in flux. But when they lose the power, they lose their identity. And that's what... The, listen, when the church loses the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've lost it all. And that's what's happening. But here's the thing. Once that happens then it, the walls come tumbling down and the barbarians come in. And this is why you have, you've, you're seeing religions, you're seeing religions uh, that are just absolutely mind-boggling that you never heard about when, when I was a kid. Who ever heard of spirit cooking? Who ever heard of that? Never heard of that. But in just the last year or so, all you got to do is a little reference into spirit cooking and you'll find out that it's associated with the sacred feminine and the sacred feminine is associated with kundalini yoga and kundalini yoga is associated with a separate which is in Kabbalah and you'll find out that they're all interconnected and they all are worshiping the same God. Have you noticed? Have you noticed that the spirit that permeates about everything in this country is feminine? Now don't make you women mad at me. That's not... Uh, point, but I just want you to notice who showed up the first day after the inauguration, wash, walking through the streets of uh, Washington. The feminine, the feminine, Sophia, Hagia Sophia was the church over there in in Istanbul, Turkey, that was turned into a mosque. What's the sacred feminine, preacher? The sacred feminine, according to these people is the dominant creative force and power behind everything else that emanates from it. It is the sacred feminine because the sacred feminine is the virgin. Athena was a virgin, yet she gives birth. You see how Satan can corrupt the truth by planting seeds to it long before it ever shows up? Genesis 3.15, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, how in the world could that happen, preacher? When God Almighty, the Father, impregnates that virgin by the power of the Holy Ghost, Amen. then she brings forth a son. That's the virgin birth. That's totally against uh, biological possibilities. All right? That is the true definition of the virgin birth, that God, the Holy Ghost, will overshadow thee. You remember, I went through all of that with the light in Hebrews 1. The Holy Spirit will overshadow thee. That holy thing is of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, not by physical means, but by the power of life itself. Life doesn't come from the physical. Life comes from the Spirit. You find out what spirit somebody's got, you'll find out about their life. The spirit is everything. It's the definition of whatever life you have. If you've got the spirit of this world, you've got the spirit of hell and the spirit of death. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got the spirit of God and the spirit of life. So the Holy Ghost will overshadow thee. That holy thing born of thee is the Holy Ghost of God. That's the virgin birth. A virgin, never known a man, is impregnated by the power of God and brings forth the God-man. Here's the satanic counterpart. A virgin, Athena, or whichever, what you, whatever you want to call her, is the source of life from within herself, not being acted on by any outside agency. She is the source of life. 
Now, what does that say to you? Then that means that the virgin or the feminine is more powerful and has more and is more important than the masculine. Now, think about Shiva, for example. Over there in CERN, Switzerland, you've got a circle. Inside that circle, you've got Shiva. Shiva is one of the Hindu triad, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Inside there, Shiva is dancing the dance of the Nataraj. So what's that? The dance of the Nataraj is the dance of destruction and creation. Both sides. And Shiva, now watch this, can be male and female at the same time. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Now we're beginning to get into it. Male and female at the same time. We have an androgynous being. We have a confounding of the gender identity. And this thing, and that's what it is, a thing, is inside this circle and dancing the dance of the Nataraj of destruction and creation. And some of the most brilliant minds in the world allowed that to be placed outside their building so it would become the religious symbol of what's going on inside that building at CERN, Switzerland, to destroy and create. In plainer words, this is the source of life coming forth, and we're going to find, we're going to find the source of life, they say, and so they're going, to, they're going to slam these particles together in this Hadron Collider. They confound gender identities. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Do you know of any country around that's got a problem between male and female bathrooms? <laughs> Do you know of a country anywhere that is no longer concerned at all with your biological anatomy? It's all how you think up here. It's called fluid gender identity. I wake up this morning, I'm a male. This afternoon, I feel like a female. Before I go to bed tonight, I don't know what I am. And so this morning, I go to the men's bathroom. And this afternoon, I'm going to the girls' bathroom. Never mind the little teenage girls in there. They don't appreciate that. I'm going in there. And now here comes the guy with the badge and the gun. Here comes the guy that makes the laws. Here comes the full weight of the government down on your head. And they say, you have to let them in there. You have to let them come in. You have to let them be this, be that, be that. What do you base that on? What is your authority for, for fluid gender identity? What is your authority for saying that somebody, is a, somebody thinks they're female or thinks they're male simply because they're thinking that? Could it be that they're receiving a spirit? Could it be that there's a spirit? A spirit? What's that called when they all meet out there in Sedona, Arizona? And they come together. Is What's that called when they all want to come together and they all want to have the same spirit at the same time? And then by having that, they're able to, they're able to push some spiritual thing to happen? Amen. Harmonic convergence? Harmonic harmony? See, harmony coming together. Convergence, they're converging, a harmonic convergence. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? How many of you know that there's a bunch of people by the thousands that meet out there in the West? I forget where it is. I think it's probably Arizona. And they've got a huge straw man. And they burn that man every year. It's where? Mojave? Yeah, what do they call that? The, the Burning Man Festival. They go out there and they burn this huge effigy. It's a, it's a straw man. They burn it. So what are they doing? They're sending up their own light. Like the Statue of Liberty's got a light coming up off of it. The light. Amen. It's just like the wisdom. The coiled serpent at the base of the spines. Kundalini, it means coiled. This coiled serpent at the base of the spine rises up until its head comes up over the top. There's seven points of chakra as it rises through the body. And the basic premise of the whole thing is wisdom. Wisdom. And you have two choices of wisdom, only two. You can take the wisdom of this world, kundalini, or you can take the personification of wisdom, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God, according to the book of Proverbs. The other wisdom is devilish. It's of the earth. 
or the wisdom of God, which is Christ. There's a counterpart for every truth. There's a counterpart to it. It's a lying, deceptive counterpart. So you have a mystery, a musterion, all right? The mysteries of the body of Christ, the mysteries of the revelation, all that, all right? Then you have the counterpart, which is a deceptive, lying counterpart. So why do you have all that, preacher? Because Satan has a trap for every, every single uh, gradation of humanity. He's got a trap for the thinkers. He's got a trap for those who only want bread and circuses. Most of the people in the world fit in the bread and circuses. So what do you mean? Give them a six-pack and sex and they're happy. They don't care who's running anything. But there's a crowd up here that thinks. They've been to college. They've had comparative religions. And they think. And they're, and they're, and they're bothered by some of the things that they observe. They see a virgin in the church of God, and then they see a virgin in the occult world. They see mysteries in the church of God, and they see mysteries in the occult world. See what I'm saying? They say, now wait a minute, which one's the source? If, I, if you have a mystery here and a mystery here, surely you've got a common origin for them. And it bothers them. This is why they create the classes over there at UT and the rest of these places, which is called comparative religions. They say that Christianity is nothing world more than an outgrowth of all of the old ancient occultist religions. It's just a product of whatever culture happened to take it and accommodate it to its culture. That the old Hebrew religion was nothing world more than the ancient Babylonian religion and the other religions around there, and it developed. That Christianity is a product of development, so forth and so on. Proof for that, dear friend. Proof for it. They have no proof for that. But let me tell you this, Satan's smart. If God said in Genesis 3.15 that a woman's seed, that seed would come from a woman and therefore a child would be born, he knew right then it would take a virgin birth for that to happen because women don't have seed. That seed would have to be supernatural. That seed would have to come from somewhere. He knew that. So what did he do? He began to lay the groundwork for the deception from that day forward. He built it into the occult religion. All of that. Everywhere. You can see, go back for thousands of years, and you can see where Satan, once he got the truth, he planted a counterfeit into the culture so that it would, it, would, uh, it, would battle, it would come against the truth. It would make it look like the truth came from the counterfeit. He's smart. Don't try to outsmart him. When Christ showed up 2,000 years ago, here's Satan. So he knew who he was. You sure he did? You sure? If thou be the Christ, he said. If thou be the Son of God. And started quoting scripture to him. I'm sure he had his, I'm sure he suspected. I'm sure he did. But Satan had never looked into that purity of the essence of Almighty God. And the Bible says, no man knows the Father but the Son, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Amen. Nobody. Nobody. And one day, a little creature of dirt like we are will be able to look into the face of that eternal being. Amen. And I don't know if that's a, how good of a thing that is. I know there's going to be a lot of rejoicing on it. But folks, I just have a feeling your knees are going to knock together. <laughs> just like mine. When you look at God. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. Good to have you back from Haiti, brother. <laughs> it looks like you're back in one piece. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost, huh? <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Will you dismiss? It was a blessing. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. Will you dismiss us, brother? service.